Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Canadian Immigration Live Q&A. My name is Mark Holthy, Canadian Immigration Lawyer. It is great to have all of you here this beautiful Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Uh, we'll just wait a few minutes here for people to join us here in the live stream. <coughs> Excuse me. There's been a couple things that have been percolating in the background. We've had some surprises with, uh, with Express Entry, which I think people weren't anticipating. And we're also seeing that the TR to PR pathway program is slowly starting to fill up, but we still have a long ways before the essential workers are full. All right, we will see you in a bit. All right, so I have a big week ahead of me. I have a presentation that I'm doing for the Conference Board of Canada's Immigration Summit. So that will be happening here in, oh, about an hour and a half, uh, right after the session here ends, which would be great. And we're talking about the future of immigration. On Friday, I will be having a, and I wonder if I can even pull this up. Let's see if I can pull this up. I'm not sure. Good old, good old Facebook. Um, I should say <laughs> good old uh, uh, Teams here that I use. Let's see if I can pull this out. And uh, I've got, we use Teams to communicate in our office. And, um, and so very often we will share different documents back and forth. And one of the ones I wanted to share was one that we created for an upcoming interview that I'm doing with the minister. Let's see if I can clear this out. Oh my goodness. This is quite, quite entertaining. Actually, I'll be honest. I'm trying to multitask here, which is never a good thing. Now I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> How do I get rid of this? <sighs> I'm trying to accomplish some things here and I'm not sure exactly what, uh, if I'm succeeding or failing here. I think I'm failing. How do I get rid of this? Oh my goodness. Uh, let's see. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do this. This is hilarious. Um, let's see. Snapshot. Bear with me, you fine folks, as I'm trying to sort out exactly how I can. Uh, wow, that's interesting. I've never done that before. I don't know what I did there. <laughs> if you guys could only see my screen as I'm multitasking, doing all of these things here, somehow I hit Command Shift 5 instead of 4. And uh, let's see here. Now I'm trying to figure out how to get rid of it. Uh, stop. Stop. There we go. Yes, I figured it out. Okay. All I wanted to do was to show you the nice little <coughs> image that my staff had created for the interview that I'm doing with the minister. And uh, and because of that, now I'm, I'm just struggling to get it. Let me just see if I can now do it properly. Yeah. So there we go. Okay. That's better. <laughs> well, all I wanted to do was pull this onto the screen right here. So I am, uh, I'm discussing the future of immigration to Canada at our upcoming Canadian Bar Association National Conference this Friday. Now it's a member only broadcast, so it's only for members of the Canadian Bar Association, uh, but that's at 10 a.m. to 11. So Minister Mendicino is joining me and we're going to have a little chat and he's got some things he's going to be sharing with us, which are great. And I get to ask him a few questions, which is always fun, the Q&A portion. And you know how I roll I'm used to doing this stuff all day, so we'll see how he answers because how he answers will probably then result in the next question that I ask him, but I'm really looking forward to it. It's great to have the immigration minister with us, and uh, it's always, yeah, it's always nice to have the person making the decisions come and share insight, and I'm hoping that he'll maybe have some, you know, some little splash or some announcement that he shares with us. In the past years, uh, previous uh, immigration ministers have done that for us. They've made some big announcements and wow, there's been no shortage of announcements this year, has there? All right, let's see who's tuning in here. Uh, make sure that you always post where you're listening from. I love to see where people are tuning in from. And I've kind of got away from that a little bit as I've invited people to, uh, you know, to just come in and, and participate and answer, que uh, post questions right away. But I love it when you guys um, post your uh, post where you're tuning in from because it gives me a real good sense of how far this little group is reaching. And the Canadian Immigration Institute is, you know, we're growing, aren't we? It's kind of fun. And I guess maybe that's because there aren't too many people that are doing what I'm doing. 
And uh, if it wasn't for all of you guys, this channel wouldn't be what it is. So I'm so, so grateful for that. Okay, uh, we've got anyone who's actually posting questions, hold off on posting your questions. We'll get to those a little bit later. Uh, let's see where people are tuning in. So we've got Ankit is in New Delhi. Uh, hello here to uh, Lualuli. L Luhili. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it when I get names that are struggling to, uh, yeah, to, to pronounce. Uh, Madun, good to see you. We've got Hitesh is in Saskatchewan. Um, Hosea says, can't wait to book for my study visa. Yes, absolutely. I know lots of you are anxious to get those moving, aren't you? Um, okay, let's see what else we've got here. Oh, good. We've got Nessa from joining from gloomy Vancouver. Well, today the temperature out here in, in Alberta, Lethbridge, Alberta, where I'm broadcasting from, let's see where it is. It feels warm. Oh, well, it's warm for my purposes. 13 degrees Celsius, so I'll take that. We've had some colder days. Now, it hasn't been these. We haven't had too many of these days now. I think we're pretty much through, but over the weekend, we actually did, or at least this past week. Uh, Jobin, it's going great, my friend. Um, you've already got a question. I know AORs. I've not seen anyone getting AORs. Some people have reported in my group that they're getting biometrics, but uh, let's hold off on the questions. If you're asking questions, hold them off. I just want to see who else is tuning in here uh, so that we can uh, give shout outs to all the people that are tuning in. So we've got Romero was in, in, um, in Toronto and Divya is also in Toronto. Oh, great. Yes, South Africa. You're from South Africa. Good to see you. And we got Harmon Deep is up in Yellowknife. Hey, Harmon Deep, did you see the last? Um, actually, do you know what? I don't think we've. I don't think we've launched it yet. I did an interview with one of the lawyers up in um, up in the Northwest Territories who works for the provincial government, and she came and talked to me and shared some insight on my Canadian Immigration podcast. But we have not yet released that. So that's one that we've got to release, Igor. If you're watching that one. And I'll just flip over here and share the screen so you can see all the different episodes. Oh, it looks like we did a, released another wild tip on immigration. I did those last summer. That was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, the last one I did was on study permits and the approval rates with Lou. Boy, LJ did a, 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 a an awesome job. Great statistics. Make sure you go here and within here, I believe, we'll pause this and go down to the actual um, the uh, the description. When you click on show more, you will see that we have, let's see, recommendation, reading list, postcard. We haven't yet posted. I'll make sure that we get that link up there where you can contact, um, basic, you can reach out to Lou to get those statistics. But uh, but this is Lou's law firm right here. And so, um, yeah, definitely check his, his site out. But uh, yeah, I, I'm going to get into the description. I wasn't sure if we'd yet posted the specific data. But this one was really good, you guys, because we had... Um, uh, let's see if I can keep going up to the top here. Oh, I guess I can't really show it because of the ads will start playing. But uh, but this one was great. It was all about uh, the study permit approval rate. So you can actually see what's happening in your country. And he tied it back to GDP. So how, you know, the gross domestic product for your uh, for your country and how that impacts on the actual approval rates. And there is a, there's a correlation there, one that's stati um, uh, statistically significant. And so it was interesting to have him come and join me. And uh, yeah, bunch of other ones, update on the TR to PR. Go check out the videos here. There's lots more um, content available and it's being released as we speak. So there we go is a little quick update. So go check that out. And uh, yes, Harmon Deep, there will be one on Yellowknife to tell everybody else what life is like up there in the Northwest Territories. All right. Um, we've got Anita who's in India here. We've got a bunch, of, and I know I skipped through a few people here, so apologies for that. Um, yeah, Farzad, I think we got you in there. And uh, Veronica was originally from Munich, but it's in Vancouver. Excellent. Um, oh, great. B. Rich is tuning in from Trinidad. That's awesome. Let's increase my audio here a little bit louder. Sometimes it's a little bit quieter. Uh, I think you guys can hear me now. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Abuja. Oh, Excellent. This is cool. I love seeing where everybody's tuning in from. It is so cool. Let's see what else we have here as I zip through. Romero's in Toronto. <laughs> Antony's in London. Excellent. Yes, we've got Namibia and Kashif is in Vancouver. 
Uh, Gurdip, hey, excellent, is in Calgary, my territory. We've got um, Anwar's Bangladesh. Uh, we've got a Facebook user who's over in the Express Entry Law private Facebook group. Those of you who are not familiar with the Express Entry Law private Facebook group, um, you guys have to go over and check it out. It's a great group. Um, let me just pull it up here and I can show you guys if I can find it. There we go. Okay, I'm going to shift this over. We have to update the uh, the banner image because the course is now completed. But this is the Canadian Immigration Institute Express, Express Entry Law this is the page right here. And we have over a hundred, almost 127,000 subscribers. And it's all about express entry right now. So you guys want to jump over there, join that group. It's private. You have to answer the questions coherently and then we'll let you in. All right, let's see who else we've got here. Um, yes, Harsh, neighbor in Saskatchewan. We've got Sudbury. Let's see, well, Saudi Arabia. Excellent. We need that UAE connection. Let's see what else we have. Uh, yep. Yeah, Joseph's in Vancouver as well. Downtown. Excellent. Abbotsford. Great. Thanks so much, guys. I love seeing Brampton. We got people, lots of people from Canada right now are tuning in. Calgary. Excellent. More Brampton. Oh, excellent. Ibru is over in Turkey and uh, another Victoria. Oh boy. I wish I was on Victoria now. That would have been awesome. Okay. All right. So we've got a bunch of people from all over. I think we've Oh, we've got Qatar here. We have um, <laughs> McGee says Pakistan, if you remember me. Ha <laughs> ha. All right. TJ's in Brampton. We could spend the whole day. Huntsville, Oshawa. Wow. Like this is crazy, you guys. Um, <laughs> Mike, it's Mark. It is Mark, you guys. It is Mark. Okay, great. Okay, so what I'm going to do, um, I just want to start off. So don't post your questions yet. Once I give you the green light, then we'll get to the questions. So if you posted them, I will have you, once I give you the green light, then I'll start um, responding to the questions after that, okay? Uh, we've got Halifax and Bangladesh and, t wait a minute, we got Tokyo, that's crazy. Awesome, East York, okay, I'll start. <laughs> and we've got um, Quebec. I don't know whether that counts to be in Canada. Well, it does count to be in Canada. Okay, I want to share a couple things that we've we've noticed here over this past since we've last connected. What do we see here, guys? I told you how unpredictable this was. It is so unpredictable. When you're looking at this, here's the draw. We just had one May 20th, right? The lowest it's been before or after the crazy um, draw 176, that that. 75 CRS draw. So this one was 395. They only took 1,842. And as someone pointed out, if you look at the see at the previous rounds, this is interesting. So you can see right here, they drew 4,147. And then one week later, they drew 1,842. When you add these together, what do we get? <laughs> are we just about, I think when you add those together, we are going to get so fourth, 1,842 plus 4,100, let me go back here. Oh, I messed it up. 4,147 plus 1,842 equals, oh, it's close. It is so close. 1,842 plus 4,147 is like 5,989, just short of, this total right here. So maybe they were playing a little bit of catch up, but there have not been too many times, you guys, where we have had two back-to-back -back draws with the same program. Now, interestingly enough, I just had a meeting with um, uh, some, some representatives of IRCC this morning at 7 a.m. And what we were talking about was the usability of this particular website and whether or not it was easy to see. And they were testing me to see how user-friendly it was. And one of the things they asked was, they said, how many CEC draws have there been since the inception of the program? That's what they asked me. And so it took me a while to figure out, okay, well, I know that this data here is sortable. So I can click that and sort just by Canadian experience class. And then <laughs> I can go and choose the last 100 entries and then scroll down to see how many draws there have been total since the program was launched. And if you go back, you guys, I can tell you until recently, there have not been nearly as many CEC only draws as you would think. So in the early days, you can see there was one 
on February the 20th of 2015. And then after that, there's only been two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. And, and that's, that's how many CEC draws only. And they've really only started since the pandemic hit in great numbers. Once the pandemic hit, then they started to do CEC only draws. So what that means for the future? Well, until the pandemic lifts and there are positive signs. So I think a lot of us have, have, have gone out and we've gotten our vaccines and we're hoping that that's going to have a positive impact on what immigration is going to do. If you're posting your questions, hold off on posting your questions till I give you the green light. And I don't actually have a green light, but I'll let you know when and then I'll start answering those questions. Okay, another, one, another thing that I want to share with you guys is right over here. Where are we at with the TR to PR pathway? Well, is it filling up fast? We'll look at this right now. So as of 9.55, which is when I opened it, and right now is 10.20. So 9.55, there were 10,097 and 15.13. Okay, so 10,097, let's refresh this. And I did this on purpose to show you how fast this is filling up. So refresh it. Two. Do you see that? Two. And I don't think anything changed there. So there's only been two people that have filed their applications since uh, like in the last hour and a half. So this is not filling up fast. I had a, um, I had a, uh, a consultation just before this and I'm, boy, I'm tired of looking at myself shifting sideways here. Where am I at with this? I got to make sure I'm in the middle of my screen. It's really irritating me that I'm, <laughs> when I do this, I'm not lined up straight. Seriously. Okay. I'm, I can fix this on the fly. You bet I can. Okay. Let's sort this out. Okay. Zoom pan. Get me over here where I'm supposed to be. Okay, there we go. Now I'm in the right spot. Okay, that works right there. See, this is production studio on the fly. Not terribly professional, but hey, that's how I roll. That's how I roll. Okay, so uh, like I said, when we flip back here, you can see that they, they have not been filling up super fast. And so there is time for you. And what's holding them back? Largely, it's language testing. And so... Um, yeah, so there's still room, there's still spots. How long will it be open? Well, I like to think that it's gonna be through June. It's not gonna be at least until July until it fills up, that's my belief, but we'll see what happens. With that being said, remember guys, the course is still open and it's 50% off right now. And so you get access to all the course material and, um, and uh, for half of what the other folks paid. So essentially it's $173.50 US you can access all the materials now. That's available. And then I think I showed you already the express entry. And then if you do have any questions or you have um, something that's really legal advice, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on, well, I'm going to turn my sound effect button up here. And then I'm going to click on that. And that indicates that your question is probably legal advice. It's not something I'd be able to answer in this Q&A. So if you want your question to be answered, Make sure that you keep it concise and short because I'm not going to read through a big long one. Um, there's, and I'm also not going to answer questions that say, am I eligible? Do I, do I qualify? Because I'll ring the bell and I'll point you right over here to book a consult um, right on our firm website. And you can actually go in and you can choose who you want to book the consult with, uh, which lawyer. And we're all immigration lawyers here. And you can just click on it and, um, and choose the lawyer that you want to book your consult with and it is available for all of you. All right, um, I think we've covered most everything, you guys, so now it is time. Now we're gonna open it up for Q and A's, and I'm gonna try to get through as many as I can, and so anyone who posts after Yayida, <laughs> and let's see who, we've got lots of YouTube here. I'm looking to see if Facebook, um, boy, YouTube is dominating the ranks here. Maybe there just are not a lot of uh, YouTubers. Here's a Facebook. Okay, now we've got the questions piling in. Okay, so we will go through and see what we can do here once I find. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so here we'll start off with uh, Ashur. Can I land and live in a province other than the one I have in my PR application other than Quebec? How do I do it? If you are not nominated through a province, um, Rayad, you have the ability to land wherever you want. If you put that you, if you put that you were coming to Lethbridge, Alberta, 
that would have been so cool. And I'd encourage you guys to all come here and live here. It'd be so awesome. Uh, but if you put that you were coming to Lethbridge, Alberta, and then you ultimately decided to go to that other place, Toronto or something, um, it doesn't matter. Immigration doesn't care. But if you were nominated, then you absolutely need to go to that province. If you have a Quebec-based application, then you better be going to Quebec to land and uh, and to live. And that so that's the only restriction. But if you just you weren't nominated through a PNP and it's not a Quebec-based application, then you can go wherever you want, except except you can't go to Quebec if it's any federal program, the permanent resident programs, because that is a no-no. All right. Okay, this is awesome. Okay, so this is someone else. Sometimes people do this, right? And I'll post it here. So it says, for more information, please contact us by WhatsApp. Emanuela Lorthy here does not even have a profile picture. This is actually pretty sad because this is obviously my group. So whenever someone posts questions like this, I will strongly encourage you not to call this number because if they don't have the credibility to actually create their own channel, um, and we don't even know who this person is, then I'd strongly recommend that you do not, under any circumstance, use them. They are not authorized, and I'd recommend that you don't use them. So I'm sure that Emanuela, if they were over on our YouTube, would probably give me a thumbs down, which is totally fine. But this stuff right here is, uh, why in the world would you trust someone who's posting that on there? Seriously, that's hilarious. Okay, so hopefully it didn't do too much damage to you, Emanuela but definitely I'd refrain from posting that in the comments. Okay, um, spouse open work permits, any updates? We're about seven months. So if you're in Canada and you're applying through a spousal sponsorship um, and you're including those open work permits in a concept of a spousal sponsorship, it's about seven to eight months. Those of you who are applying from outside of Canada, if you have a spouse that's outside, unless they have a job offer, well, even in those circumstances, they're still only focused on essential work. So it's it's a tough one. Okay, let's see here. Hey, Mark, why do you think eight-month post-grad work permit is too short? I think I can get a job in eight months, engineer qualified well. Well, yeah, understand that the problem, that why it's too short is because to get through the Canadian Experience class, you need to have worked for at least a year. And if you're going through the express entry process, they don't count any of your student work experience towards the express entry. Now, the TR to PR pathway does, and um, you can count that work experience. But when it comes to the post-grad work permit, you never want to take a program. I'll be honest, I never, ever encourage people to take a one-year program. Just don't. Because your, your, your post-grad work permit's only going to be valid for one year. Take the time, do a two-year program, get the three-year open work permit, and then you have options. What if you don't start the job until one month into your work permit? Well, if your work permit's expiring and that employer isn't willing to give you an LMIA or something to extend that work permit, then you're going to be in a position where you can't meet the minimum el eligibility and options for permanent residents are very limited. So that's why I never like to do that. So any overseas agents or anyone who's, um, you know, even schools that are encouraging you to take a one-year program, don't do it. That's my recommendation, my opinion. Okay. Yep. Same thing, Ibrahim. We're in the same situation with these FSW draws. Not going to happen until the travel restrictions start to lift. Yes, people are getting vaccinated. There are a lot of people that are having their, their, their shots. Um, all of my kids all have their first shots as well as my wife and I. And we're just waiting to see, you know, what's going to happen when we have the ability to do the second shot. But I think generally speaking in Canada, we're headed in the right direction. And when those cases start to go down and life starts to resume, that's when the FSW draws will start to go. We'll see a lot more of those open draws. Okay, Romero says, hey, I used your course to submit an express entry application in November, but I'm now also qualified for the new PR for essential workers. Should I submit another application? Romero, it really comes down to how far along in the process you are. So we know, and I believe, that express entry will continue to go faster than the TR to PR pathway. You know, ultimately, the, the people that are at the head of the TR to PR pathway are going to start to see acknowledgments of receipt. They are going to start to see their applications get approved uh, sooner, but someone like you who was in the back end behind all of these 40,000 international grads and the 10,000, um, you know, uh, individuals and the 1,000 uh, essential workers, I guess 11,000, almost 12,000 essential workers, you're behind all of them, Romero. And so the only reason that I would consider doing both is if you have some doubt or some concern about your eligibility for the express entry. If there's some question, then I will do multiple applications 
but not in the same streams, okay? That's the TR to PR pathway. But great, Romero, and you can. Re I recommend that you go over and subscribe to the uh, to the TR to PR pathway course. One thing you'll find, Romero, is that the course has been significantly enhanced since you purchased it back in November. Well, that's the express entry as well as the TR to PR pathway. Okay, so here's a question. Zainab says, is the chances of a student visa rejection more if I'm living in a country of resident Saudi and applying through an agent in home country, Sri Lanka, unable to go because of travel restrictions? Zainab, that's a question I can't answer. Um, you know, ultimately immigration uses a number of factors when they're determining uh, whether or not to approve an application. One of them is, do they believe you'll return home to your country if the, when the study permit is completed? Right. The whole purpose of study permits is to show how the education is going to help you improve your job prospects in your home country. And if that's the case and you're in a different country, um, you have to show how you have ties back to your home country, Sri Lanka, because everybody knows if you're not a, a citizen of, of any of Saudi Arabia or any of the UAE countries or, or I shouldn't say UAE countries or the UAE, um, that you're not getting citizenship. And so all of your status is often very much based on work. And so in those circumstances, you, you know, not being able to show that you have significant ties to Sri Lanka is more of an issue than the location in which your, you know, your, your agent is working for you. So those are some things to consider. Okay. Um, all right. Will I get rejection because of current immigration status? That's an open-ended one, Zanab. I can't answer that one. Um, ultimately, it depends upon what country are you in Canada or outside Canada. If you're going through the TR to PR pathway, you have to show that you have status or an ability to restore. Okay. Yep, Roshan, no AORs. If anybody is receiving AORs, please post them in the comment below because I'd love to see if anyone has. When I go over to our group and those of you who are looking to subscribe to the TR to PR pathway program, I'm just going to jump in here and let's see if I can find right here. And I'm going to jump straight to the TR to PR pathway course private group. So in this group right here, we actually have a tracking sheet. And I can see just, just looking very carefully that we have one person that, that has, is claiming that they've received biometric instructions. And, that they, and another person is claiming that they've been able to link their profile to their, um, link their, their application to their, to their portal. I'm not exactly sure how that works, but, um, but you can see there's no AORs just at a high level in our group. So if you, if you slide over here and... Um, and connect in and, and join our TR to PR pathway program and you purchase, you'll also have access to the group and all the communications and everybody sharing insight. And it's an awesome, awesome little place for you. So go check that out. 50% um, off is the course registration right now. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, does a retail sales supervisor can apply through TR to PR pathway? Hitesh, this is where a title doesn't mean anything to me. What, what means something to me is whether or not an individual's duties actually align with that position and whether or not you can prove that not code. When you're going into the TR to PR pathway, and if we go here, let me just pull up TR to PR, and I'll share my screen with you while I'm doing this. So I search TR to PR um, pathway, and then I go to... Uh, here and then let's see if we can find the policy. So that's that. Archives. Oh, I'm hanging on. There's a video still, aren't I? <laughs> okay, let's see if we can find it. There's so many here. Actually, I'm gonna have to go back here and then go to policy. And then that will pull up the right one here, I think. Actually, I'm gonna go back again. Da, 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 da. Interesting. Google, there's so many people pumping out information on the TR to PR pathways. Um, I'll just go here, see if I can find it. There it is. Took me a while to find this. So in here, when it comes to the eligibility requirements, you, when you're going through to, to determine whether or not you meet the essential occupations, you, you have to go to the source. And so if you go to the source and then you scroll down to the bottom, it shows right here, everyone that is a part of these programs. And so when it comes to supervisors, often what I'll do is um, I'll just Google it. So you can see retail salesperson. Do you see them on the list right here? Okay. And as I go through here, what other retail do we have? Retail butchers, retail salesperson. 
Okay. So when I look at this and these three different things, what this tells me is that a retail sales supervisor is not on the list. And why is it not on the list? And this is something that many people ask. So when it comes to any supervisor, often supervisors are working in the background and it's the front line people, the retail sales people that are right on the front line that are the ones that are, um, you know, really in that essential worker category. And if I flip back here and show you this again, you guys, you'll see what is the knock code? It's 6421. This is a low skill position. This position does not have any pathways to permanent residence through the Canadian experience class. A retail sales supervisor does because it's a skill level B. And so that's one of the reasons, Hitesh, why it's not on there. Okay, let's see here. Um, Guillermo, let's see, Guillermo says, Ronaldo, oh, Brasileiro, por certeza. Okay, thanks for the amazing content. Will the upcoming changes to the FSW affect those that already received an ITA and are waiting processing? Um, no. So understand when you say the, the upcoming changes to the FSW, the people that are, have already received an IT and have submitted their application, your applications are locked in. So changes don't happen retroactively. All right. Okay. When can I expect an AOR? <laughs> we do not know yet. We don't. And we're just going to have to wait and see until the first ones come. And then once they do, then we'll be in a position where we're able to understand exactly how best to proceed. And then it says, um, under the TR to PR, I upload my all required docs without any error, also attached PCC, medical, what will be the processing standards? Well, obviously, if you've got everything in there, then you're going to have a very good chance of getting your application approved. Anyone that's missing things from their TR to PR pathway, you guys have to understand that there is a very strong likelihood that, you know, immigration could reject your application. And uh, that's one of the questions I get more often than not when I have consultations with people and they've given very little instructions on how to perfect an application. Uh, we know that R10, like I've said repeatedly, that regulation 10 that, uh, that allows uh, officers to reject because the simplest little things are missing, that applies only to express entry, not this. But if you're missing eligibility stuff, like you don't have a language test when you submit your application, I can tell you in those, circ those circumstances, your application will get rejected. That much I can tell you. All right, let's keep zipping through here to the next one. That's an interesting one, Gautam. I haven't really received this question before. Um, is it okay if one gets two gift deeds from different family members for the proof of funds? No, there's no problem with that. I, there's no restrictions as long as you can trace the funds and that they're truly a gift and not a loan. This is an interesting, interesting one. Sawan says, can I claim unemployment benefits while awaiting for a result for my TR to PR pathway application? So this is a very interesting question. So you indicated at the time in which you submitted your application, hopefully, that you were employed. And are you saying now that you've actually been laid off after you submitted your application? That's possible. In terms of claiming unemployment benefits, that's outside of the confines of this. Um, you need to check the provincial regulations for where you live, the province, because um, you, you know ultimately when it comes to unemployment benefits, um, follow the instructions that are there, follow the instructions that are set out for your particular region. And uh, I can't tell at this stage without knowing a whole bunch more as to whether or not you would actually be able to claim them. Here's some high level stuff. And if you go over to our website, I'll point you back here. We'll go to our website. I want you guys to know that here on the website, if you go to our blog, you will see that there's a whole bunch of information that's available for you here. So credential recognition and other challenges that faced by newcomers. This is the, a podcast that I did. Can students be working after the end of studies? If you scroll down here, we've got a bunch of different blog posts that we posted here, including as we scroll down to the bottom, Da, 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 da. older entries. I guess we have to go back further here. Let's see what's on here when I go back to older entries. Okay. Can foreign workers get employment insurance benefits in Canada? This is something that we produced last year. And I recommend that you take a look and read that blog post. And that will provide some assistance and help for you in understanding at least the basic requirements when it comes to claiming that. Hey, we cover everything in this, don't we guys? We cover everything. All right. Let's see what's next here. Um, Okay, 
Okay, um, forum. I would need a. I would need more information with this. Can I use a caregiver work experience in an FSW application? It depends on what NOC code ultimately that you're fitting under. Most caregivers. Um, well, it just depends. I can't even. You know, I can't even say yes or no because at the end of the day, it comes down to whether or not you meet the requirements of the FSW program, the eligibility section, and NOC code and your duties. And having them line up as a skilled occupation, that's really what it comes down to. So that's nothing, not something that I can answer right now because I need a whole lot more information. Okay, uh, yep, I've showed you how to book a consult with the firm. Just go back here and then you just have, all you have to do is click on book a consult right there. And there's a link in the description below where you can go right there to book a consult. All right, zipping through here. Um, yeah, how fast do I think AOR to decision will be? Well, that's that's interesting. Um, traveling for a couple of weeks for essential reasons, risky. I never would encourage anyone to travel. The reality is once you leave, the travel restrictions come into play. And normally it's not an issue, but I've seen crazy things happen. And when it comes to your TR to PR pathway course, or sorry, the, the <laughs> I see that I, I'm saying that TR to PR pathway course so frequently. When it comes to the TR to PR pathway program, one of the requirements is that you are in you are in Canada when that application is approved. And if you get stuck outside, Jason, and you can't get back in, it could it could cause your whole TR to PR pathway to unravel. If that's the program you're talking about. Express entry, if you're a Canadian experience class, the same rules don't apply for the CEC. Okay. Um, yeah. And Kit, this minister's interview is a part of the, um, it's a part of my uh, conference, the Canadian Bar Association's Immigration Conference. And I'll just show you guys here if I flip my screen around. So the, the CBA, um, let's see, Immigration Conference 2021. If you click on here, our online symposia, then it will take you to the ones that, uh, that we're doing right now. And if we look at, uh, we just go here, details and registration. It, we should be able to find it here. Yeah, so the Canadian CBA immigration. So you can see it's over a series of four days, the 28th, the 4th, the 11th, and the 17th. And when you click on this online symposium right here, you will see that um, it's called You're on Mute, Changes and Challenges of Immigration, the New Normal. It's reserved for immigration lawyers, and that's why you don't ha have the ability to... Um, to register for it, uh, but this this program and this course right here, you can see the opening plenary Q and A session with Minister Mendicino. When I click on that and open it up right here, um, you'll see the breakdown, and then the minister is going to present our volunteer awards, and then I right here, moderator, will be the one asking the minister the Q and A session. Uh, uh, basically uh, going through that Q&A session with him and kind of moderating this initial one. But I, as the national chair, this is my conference. So I'm hoping that it's going to work out really well. We've got a fantastic lineup, but it's just for the Canadian Bar Association. So, um, but anything that we learn, trust me, you guys, I will be sharing it here. Okay. Um... <laughs> I know, I wish, Emil. I wish, <laughs> I don't know if they would call me friend. That's for sure. But definitely we all understand the situation and know how much we want you guys to, to, to be here. And really talk to Justin Trudeau, talk to our prime minister. It's the cabinet who makes these decisions on the orders in council. It's they who are making a decision whether or not someone can come into Canada or not. And so it's them really more so than immigration even. And so if you want to petition, petition the prime minister of Canada. He's the one that's making the decision to keep people out. Okay, Lej says, can we apply for a PhD with PhD transcript only without finishing graduating? Uh, no, you need to actually have completed it. So you need to have confirmation of that you've actually finalized and obtained that credential. Okay, here's a question I get a lot about Zenab, and I can't actually answer this one for you. Lots of people are wondering, well, should I proceed forward with education right now or should I wait until next year? And, you know, there's lots of uncertainty right now. There's a lot of reasons why you should consider doing it now while you've got your acceptance maybe and you can get in. Or um, those of you who haven't yet applied, it's, it's really tough. 
Um, and that's not something that I can advise you guys on. That's a decision that you guys are going to have to make yourselves. There, but there are pros and cons to both. Some people may be able to get in and get started and get moving right now. Others may say, well, I really want to have the experience of being able to attend in person and, and, um, and really benefiting fully from the education and having potentially more job opportunities on the, on the back end when the pandemic is over. Because obviously a lot of you who are studying will want to stay and become permanent residents. And you need to make sure that there are pathways. You've seen what's happened to international graduates and students last year in 2020 because of the pandemic when school was out. Many of them were laid off. They didn't have work. And even the, the public policy that allowed for post-grad work permits to be extended uh, an additional 18 months was a humanitarian process that was once again restricted to, you know, a one-time only thing. And so you have to take that into consideration when you're making decisions and you have to make the decision yourself. You have to, you have to do your research. And so Zainab, that's not something that I can help you with. Okay, uh, let's see this one here. If you guys are asking questions like this, I'm gonna ring those bells, okay? So I, some people are making comments, always oh, only answering the easy questions. Guys, questions like this, okay, while filing my nationality in IELTS exam, I entered Canada and now I have received a, 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 a TRF for same. Is it a serious issue, TR to PR? So this right here, I'll ring the bell because you really need to book a consult right over here <laughs> on our website and so that we can look at this in detail because it's definitely not something that I can advise you in those circumstances uh, given what you've, the limited information that I have. Yeah, Hyun, do you reckon there will be FSW draw sometime this year? I'm hoping for the fall. That's what I'm hoping for. When the borders start to open, that's when you guys will know that the open FSW, that will be inclusive of FSW, that's when those draws will open up. And trust me, they want you here. They want to meet the levels plan. They don't want to keep you out. But it's, it's, um, it's Canada Health and uh, it's public health and the cabinet, uh, uh, you know, from within parliament that are making these decisions. Okay, Isuru has got another question here. I think it was a two-part question. He says, and now I have a chance to get a new job offer through a, my friend, so I would like to know if I get another job offer, is it possible to change my employer? Can I apply for an open work permit? Isuru, I'm sorry I missed the other one. I'm not going to be able to search back through it. Um, when it comes to, I'll try to answer this generally. When it comes to the TR to PR pathway, you can change employers. When it comes to CEC, you can change employers. So there's no restrictions on that. You would just advise immigration. But in terms of uh, a job offer, um, ultimately, I don't know whether you're claiming points for it. And in some cases, even in the context of job offer, sometimes you have the ability through PNP programs to modify that or change employers. Um, but uh, I need a whole lot more information, Isuru. And once again, I'd ring the bell for you. Aha, uh -huh. Sandeep says, I forgot to mention my refusal. That's an issue. And we've seen repeatedly in the past that immigration has been showing a willingness to, well, uh, uh, they have shown that they will um, find misrepresentation when people have forgotten to explain refusal. So that could be a very, uh, could be an issue, Sandeep. At the earliest opportunity, you want to up, you want to update immigration. And if we have something serious like that, I wouldn't even hesitate to go over to this page right here, even though, you know, and I don't know what this is TR to PR is, um, is absolutely, if you're talking about forms, I'm assuming this is what you're going to go through. So then I would go over to the IRCC web form here. And even though we go here and we select permanent residence applied online, if you go here and you look, you can see it still only shows express entry. But in your situation, you may want to just try to update them using your UCI. Here, let me go back here. You don't have a file number, but you can provide your, your client ID and provide as much detailed information as well that says, hey, although I chose express entry, I have applied for, right in this spot here, I have applied for the TR to PR pathway and I made a mistake and I want to correct it as soon as possible. You could try that, uh, Sandy because that is an issue. People need to be very careful. And many people are very lax on it. They just, you know, they don't realize and they don't, they don't pay attention. Um, okay, let's see here. 
Okay, so Shiv, it really comes down. He's got two options. He's applied through the TR to PR, and he's got an ITA. Should I go for C CEC? Um, uh, I'm assuming it's a ITA, I think, is what you're talking about there, as opposed to ITR. Um, there's nothing stopping you from having two applications in the queue. If you're prepared to, you know, to, to blow whatever, the 550 or whatever the processing fee is, um, as opposed to the right of permanent resident fee, that one you would get back. Um, you can apply. There's nothing stopping you. So if you want to, if you want to hedge your hedge your bets and and uh, submit through both, just to make sure in case one is rejected, I will often advise my clients to do that, Shiv. But it's a decision that you need to make. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Okay, Masa says. For Alberta PNP, the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program, uh, do we need to be working in Alberta, one, and have proof of the funds of the time of submission express entry? Okay, the Alberta PNP, yes, you have to be working in Alberta. Um, there are some limited exceptions if they've given you a nomination, but the expectation absolutely right now in this current world that you are living and working in Alberta, and you have proof of funds at the time of submitting express entry or at the time, okay, so I think maybe you've got it through express entry, but usually the express entry applications are only submitted or through the express entry stream are only being issued to people that are living and working in Alberta. So I hope that's the case. Um, have proof of the fund at the time of submitting express entry at the time we would be requesting for submitting these documents. Yeah, when it comes to proof of funds, you always have to have them at the time in which you submit your EAPR. So that's when you demonstrate that masa. But the OINP doesn't ask. Uh, sorry, the the AINP doesn't ask about uh, funds for the purpose, purposes of the nomination. It is to maintain your eligibility for the CEC. Um, so that's the rules that you have to follow. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Mitt says, "What if my pay stub displays fifteen sixty hours? Is it okay, or should I explain more?" you're absolutely gonna explain more. Your reference letter needs to explain how many hours you worked, the duration of work, and one of the challenges you guys have if you're claiming points as a student is that your hours will fluctuate from 20 to 40 or you know, uh, obviously in the regular scheduled breaks or if you took advantage of the ability to work extra hours during the time if you fit within the essential worker uh, occupations then you could have worked for a short period of time. I think it was around April to August, but don't quote me. You you were able to work full time during that period of time as an essential worker. In those cases, um, you're gonna wanna really step stipulate how you meet the regular hours. Because just because you've earned 1,560, um, if your work has been under 30 hours a week, then that's not considered full time. And I take a very conservative approach when it comes to calculating hours of work. And uh, ultimately, the final decision, Mitt, I'm going to ring the bell again and say, book a consult and we can go through it and we can look at it and I can help you. Okay. Um, okay, so <laughs> Girl Happy says, can a person apply for EE having 10 months of experience and accept an ITA when completing 12 months? Okay, so here's how it works. You can, it, when you submit your application, it's by month. So there's nothing stopping you from submitting your application <clears throat> if IRCC, the portal, the CRS calculation that's done, um, if it, well, the eligibility to get into the portal, if based on you indicating the months, um, rounds up for T getting 12, there's nothing stopping you from getting your application in the pool. And yes, if you get an ITA before you have the full 12 months, you are not going to submit that EAPR until you have reclaimed that full amount, which will be with your current employment. Okay. We've got another one, visa rejected. That's an issue, you guys. Absolutely, same reason that I explained just previously, Syed. You need to do everything you can to correct that because I've seen repeatedly immigration find misrepresentation and issue five-year bars for people. There's not a guarantee that that's gonna happen, but it's a distinct possibility if you haven't disclosed a refusal in that, you know, your, your, um, your uh, background declaration form. Okay. Yes, Akram says, should the 1,560 hours should be immediate last three years, 36 months? If it's the TR to PR pathway, yes. If it is the Canadian Experience class, yes. Um, ultimately, if you're going through, say, the Federal Skilled Worker Program, then it just needs to be within the last 10 years. Continuous. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay, here's a police certificate question that can benefit people. Christina says, regarding police clearance certificates, I got my clearance um, till 2021. Okay, not quite sure what the till means. Uh, June was the date I applied. However, I left my country in 2019 and never went back. Is that a problem? Okay, so the rule is, if you obtain your police certificate after you left that country, then it doesn't expire. So you can continue to use it. If you've never returned back there and it was issued after you left, if you were still there, even for a day after you got it, then it's only valid for six months and you would need to get a new one. That's the general rule. Okay, let's see what else we have here as I'm zipping through the questions. This is another one, Ecta says, will they reopen it? So if you look at this and we go back here, the question is this cap for international graduates right here, 40,000, it is full. So will, because these are not filling up super fast, especially these ones here, if there are spaces still available here, will they reopen this at a later date to allow more international grads in? We know that the minister has said it is something that they're looking at. And uh -huh, this is one of the questions that I'm going to ask him in the context of our, um, our live Q&A that we're going to be doing um, for the conference. It's not here on YouTube. It's not on Facebook. It's only for the Canadian Bar Association immigration lawyers that have registered. And so um, that's a question that I'm going to ask, but we don't know. But trust me, guys, if I hear anything, I will let you know. Okay. Uh, okay, Nebneet, you are just going to sit and you're going to wait. So you submitted your application May 2020. It has been, if it's CEC and you're in Canada, then I recommend that you do request your GCMS notes. Take a look and see if they're conducting some kind of a further review. Because at this time, yes, you are past the period of time where they're processing applications. And I think um, for your finalizing, I, I would request the GCMS notes. That's what I would do. And, and see if there is something that they're looking at. And if you find that there's something there, then book a consult with me and I can help you to sort out how best to address it. Because really, if applications are stalled out. Now, one other thing, Navneep, that I don't know is whether or not you have family that are outside of Canada. And that can also delay processes because they're not pushing things forward if you have dependents that are outside of Canada. Yeah, Molly, when it comes to this, I'm also going to ring that one because it depends on a whole bunch of different factors, including the purpose of entry, immediate family members. Um, you know, how does your sister fit into that context? But we're seeing all kinds of things like where is your sister uh, at? Is your sister in, in India? Like are there, there are restrictions on travel, all these things. And so that's when I can't answer. Uh, the sir joined a little bit late today. No problem, my friend. No problem. Okay, let's see here. Okay, here's another question that's an interesting one. So Murat says, if I apply for a study permit now for January semester, can I come to Canada during the summer before school starts? This is something that we're seeing a lot of conflicting information with immigration. Ultimately, you have to be available and ready to start they don't want people that are just kind of hanging around. And so often what you'll see is a border officer will say, well, is this an essential entry or is it not? Is it non-discretionary or non-optional? Well, coming early months in advance, many officers, and I've seen them interpret this as being non-essential at this time, as, sorry, yeah, as being basically optional and, uh, and not allow people in. So Murat, I can't answer specifically, but it's very dangerous to... to consider coming uh, that that far in advance for school, especially during the summer. Absolutely, I will update you guys. No word yet, Dianara, on the bridging open work permit. And remember, it won't be a bridging open work permit. It will be something like the humanitarian process used to create the, um, the post-grad work permit the new public policy to extend for 18 months. All right. That was a great question. And guys, I, it is now time. 
It is now time to start the sign off music. Um, it has been an absolutely great Q&A today. Once again, I haven't been able to get through a fraction. And I don't know, maybe you guys can comment below. One thing I've considered is setting up some kind of a super chat so that if people want to pay a dollar or something like that or or setting up something else that then they can kind of advance their question up through the ranks. I'm not sure if I'm going to institute that, but you can see there are so many questions that were asked here that I never got to. And one hour is not a lot of time and it's really hard and there are so many questions that have been posted. Now I know a lot of people here have um, a lot of people have posted uh, questions that are similar to others. So hopefully in the process of listening to the responses to others, you've got a response to yours. <laughs> Nikita says, yes, super chat a dollar. That's hilarious. So I don't know if I'm going to go that direction, but I'm, I'm very, very mindful of the fact that, you know, lots of people post questions and I just don't get to them. Now, remember always, if you guys have a very, very personal question that you need assistance with, Remember, all you need to do is to click on the link below to book a consult with the firm and you can reach anyone, myself or any one of the lawyers, immigration lawyers, and you can book a consult and get the answers that you need. And uh, I do those very, very frequently. Also, remember you guys that are looking at the tr to pr pathway right now, the course and the link is below. Um, it's 50% off. I just finished an express entry, um, another express entry course, which was awesome. The people in that course were fantastic and you can access that the same way you access this course. When you go to the Canadian Immigration Institute, Canadian Immigration Institute, uh, let me pull this down just a little bit so that you guys can see it. When you go to the Canadian Immigration Institute right here, this will then take you to this page where you can click on see our courses and you'll see we have the TR to PR pathway. We have the express entry course. We have the LMIA course for high wage positions and click right here to, to leave us your email and let us know once we get enough critical mass, then I'm going to launch the spousal sponsorship course. This is what I love doing guys. Thanks so much for watching. And every Wednesday I will try to be here 10 a.m. Mountain time. All right, take care. Have a great, great day and good luck navigating this crazy world that we call Canadian immigration. Thank you.